Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. You may notice that my face is looking a little bit orange today. No, it is not because I'm a Trump supporter and no, it is not because I made out with Snooki. It is because I played about 30 minutes of basketball outdoors and I am extremely pasty. Today we're going to be talking about Citus, which is not in fact an STD, but it is something used to scale out Postgres horizontally. So let's go ahead and get into it. All right, this video probably won't be the longest one ever, uh, but it is one that I want to crank out nonetheless because I'm going to Greece next week and so I got to get some videos created in time. Um, basically, the reason that I'm making this video is not necessarily because it's going to introduce a ton of technical content, but like I've been saying, I feel like I've brushed over a lot on this channel about the specifics of how you might do things like, I don't know, use Kafka properly, or do sharding, or do replication, or something like that. So when it comes to just like a really, really simple SQL database, here's an example of how you might do it. <clears throat> So basically, Citus is a Postgres extension that is going to allow you to turn one single Postgres machine into a cluster of machines and then distribute tables over them. So basically, that's going to allow us to use more CPU, disk, or memory than would be allowed on just a single computer. So basically, uh, depending on the actual parameters of the query, uh, a query is going to be routed to either all of the nodes or a subset of nodes in the cluster. There's technically another way of sharding in Citus where you do something called setting a search path and then pretty much every query that you make from there will only hit a subset of tables. But I'm going to focus more so on uh, what they call row-based sharding, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So one term that I want to introduce uh, before we get into the meat of this video is one that's common in the Citus docs, so I think it's going to make it a little bit more clear for those of you who choose to read those after this. Basically, they introduce the idea of a tenant. So they try and think of you know, a Postgres database as something that might be used as a SaaS company, right? So if I'm a SaaS company like Salesforce, and you know, you've got hundreds of small companies using your piece of technology, and each one of them basically has their own siloed data, they might have siloed data, but they might ultimately be sharing a database within Salesforce, right? And so the idea is that none of that data is actually related to one another. When it gets queried, it's going to be uh, queried as if it were its own separate table. That being said, creating a bunch of small separate tables is going to be a pretty inefficient use of resources. There's a lot of overhead to all of those. And so what's better is when you have all of these tables with the same exact schema, but you know they might represent multiple different tenants within them. So basically, what we do want to make sure is that if we do have all of these tenants, right, and we've got a bunch of different tables, and the tenants might be present in multiple different tables, so for example, a table that represents customers and maybe a table that represents orders, for a given tenant, we probably want the data for the same tenant to live on the same exact uh, Postgres node in a cluster because that's going to make doing things like joining it or you know writing to multiple of those tables at the same time a lot easier. And we'll make that example a little bit more concrete in a little bit. So let's look at the high-level architecture of how Citus works. Like I mentioned, it's just a plugin to a normal Postgres table or Postgres node. So basically, this would be like you know a singly deployed Postgres database. Same with this guy. Same with this guy. That being said, when you do install Citus, one of those nodes in the cluster is labeled the coordinator. And the coordinator is responsible for who the client is going to be talking to. So the client is going to send all queries and receive all query results back from the coordinator. Great. So the coordinator is going to hold some sort of metadata table, which is just local, right? This is not a distributed table. And the metadata table is basically going to say, for each distributed table, here's where all of the shards of that table live. They're going to be distributed across both the coordinator and worker nodes. So for example, if I've got you know, an orders table, which has a shard 3, a shard 1, and a shard 2, uh, those might be distributed on the coordinator and the workers accordingly. Now, even though these are you know, distributed tables in aggregate, really they're just built out as normal Postgres tables living on one of those worker nodes. So when you send a query like this to the coordinator, what it really cares about is something like this part of it, where we say store ID equals six. When it sees that, the coordinator is going to basically consult its local metadata table and then use that to route the query to the appropriate node, get the data back, and return it to the client. It's also possible in theory that maybe you know the client wouldn't do something like this, but might say like select sum of dollar cost across all orders, in which case now the coordinator is not only going to be routing queries to this shard right here, but also to this shard and also this guy and aggregating them together. Cool, so let's discuss what that metadata table looks like in a little bit more depth. 
The metadata table is itself a local table, which means that it just lives on the coordinator. It doesn't live in the metadata table, obviously, because this is the metadata table, but it's an example of a local table. And basically, it's going to contain all of the names of the shards, right? So like a name or a shard ID. It's going to contain the address of the worker that it lives on so that the coordinator knows where to route queries to that shard too. And then it's also going to contain a start and end of a hash range. So the reason this is relevant is because when you create a distributed table in Citus, you have to describe something known as a distribution column. So that distribution column is going to have to exist in every single one of these distributed tables. And basically how we're going to decide which shard a given row is in is based on the value of that distribution column. You know, if that has a value of x, we take hash of x, and then that is going to put it into one of these buckets for a hash start and hash end. And so once we identify which bucket it belongs in, that tells us which shard it's in, it tells us which worker to route the row to, and then we're good to go. And there can be, you know, however many shards you want in a given table, you actually configure it at table creation time. Okay, in addition to the idea of a local table, again, a metadata table is an instance of a local table, we also have reference tables. These are really useful uh, when you have a small amount of information that you basically want to broadcast to every single one of the worker nodes. Sometimes in certain join queries, it's very common to you know, join a bigger distributed table with a you know, very small table. So for example, if I have a mapping of a bunch of country codes, because that might be like a foreign key in every single table, but it's a small set of countries, uh, as well as their country name, and I'm frequently joining those two, it's probably better that this table right here lives on every single worker node. The reason being that then I don't have to do a distributed join. I can you know, reference local data, and it's going to be a lot easier to get that done. Now, because reference tables are fairly small, Citus makes the trade-off of saying, you know what, every single time we update one of these things, we're just gonna do a two-phase commit and update that table on every single one of the worker nodes. Now, if this is something like a country code table where it's changing very infrequently, this trade-off makes a lot of sense. Okay, there's also this concept of co-location. Basically, like I mentioned, Citus is specifically useful for when you have this kind of multi-tenant architecture, right? Where you have a distributed table that even though it's giving away the abstraction of every single tenant has their own table, really you've got multiple different rows where each row corresponds to potentially a different tenant, and that's based on that distribution column. So what you want to do in this case, let's imagine we've got, you know, uh, two different tables for uh, you know, our tenants, and we're frequently joining those together. We want to be sure that the rows for every single tenant from both tables are living on the same machine. That way we can join them much more quickly. Basically, Citus is smart enough to say, okay, if for both of these distributed tables, we're using the same distribution key column name, the same distribution key column type, and the same number of shards, it's smart enough to say, okay, I think these guys should be co-located. So I'm going to take the corresponding hash ranges of both tables and make sure that those get co-located on the same worker node. That way our joins are going to be a lot faster. This is also just gonna make it so you get even better SQL compatibility in terms of, you know, I give Citus a SQL query and it is in fact able to route it to the right place. Uh, another thing that this does is on the right path, even besides the read path, it's nice to be able to do co-located joins, but on the right path, if I wanna update both of these tables atomically, I don't have to run a two-phase commit, right? I can just actually use a normal transaction on every single individual database node. So just to visualize what that looks like, if we've got you know two tables called orders and maybe customer information, this guy might contain uh, both of those tables for the hash range zero to 50. And this guy, worker two, might contain both of those tables with the hash range of 50 to 100. Cool, I already touched upon this a little bit earlier, but in addition to you know allowing just you know routing a, a query to one particular worker node, if you don't specify uh, a value for the distribution key, uh, you're probably going to need to run that query across all worker nodes. And this is a good thing, potentially, uh, because you can take advantage of parallelization, right? So if you have some sort of aggregation query like we covered before, if you're taking a sum, this is going to be really nice because now all of a sudden you can run that distributed across many nodes and use more CPU cores to compute that a value. Uh, that being said, of course, at the end of the day, everything is going eventually back through your coordinator node to you, right? So it goes client to coordinator to all the workers, and then the coordinator aggregates those results, and then it goes back to the client. 
So if for whatever reason we just did like a select star of that entire table, now the coordinator has to aggregate a ton of data and it's probably going to become the bottleneck. So this is going to be a lot more efficient when we're doing aggregations, but if the eventual data size that you're outputting back to the client is really large, the coordinator may become a bottleneck, so you should be cognizant of that. Another thing to note that I touched upon already is that Citus is doing static sharding. So when you actually create a distributed table in Citus through the create distributed table command, you typically specify a number of shards to use. So basically the idea here is, you know, a couple things. One, how many shards do you want to use? But two, also what happens if you need to rebalance them? Citus is ultimately a pretty simple plugin, right? We've spoken about a lot of databases that are good at rebalancing shards when they need to and you see an imbalance in load, but ultimately Citus isn't really that great at that. It's just going to be using hash ranges, it's not really doing any adaptations of those ranges over time, and if you do need to rebalance the number of shards for a particular table, it's going to completely rebalance them and reshuffle everything, which is a pretty expensive operation. It's also going to be completely manual, so you probably want to do it when there's some downtime. Now that being said, this is probably sufficient for a lot of tables out there. It's not going to be perfect for everything, uh, but there are probably tables where there's lower amounts of load and you can get away with doing this type of thing and just have like a planned outage or something like that. Additionally, typically speaking, uh, you know, you want to pick a number of shards that's relative to the number of CPUs in the cluster. That's going to be really useful if you're doing analytics queries because that way you can just balance out your data very well across every single cluster. Uh, if you are doing this because you, know, you have a bunch of different tenants and you want to spread those out, well then maybe you want to do it relative to the number of actual tenants themselves because at this point it's like, well, you know, I don't actually need that many, uh, you know, I don't actually need that much performance because I only have so many tenants, so I don't want to make a multiple of shards that's a number of the CPUs in the cluster because then they're going to go to every single worker node and we don't really need that, right? Uh, Citus is going to basically take shards within a table and round robin them across worker nodes unless it thinks it explicitly needs to co-locate a couple of them. And so as a result of that, basically what we're going to end up doing here is uh, you know, just being sure that we're not over provisioning too many shards. Shards obviously are going to have overhead because they themselves are Postgres tables and so you don't want to create too many of them if you don't have to. Finally, one small thing to note is that uh, we haven't really spoken about replication in this video and I'm not planning to very much. Um, Citus does allow you to basically take these shards and replicate them normally, uh, just with normal Postgres replication. Uh, so you know you can stream that over to a backup, but it doesn't have any high availability mode. So you'd have to use an additional Postgres extension or something along those lines to make it so that you know if one of the primaries goes down in the cluster, uh, that you perform a failover to the replica, and then you know the metadata table and the coordinator gets updated to now start pointing to that replica. Uh, part of the reason for that is just if you think about it, like you really should only be hitting primaries when you have a like a partition situation like this because otherwise if some of the nodes that you're hitting are primaries and then other nodes that you're hitting are replicas you may have some causal consistency issues there if you're trying to join that data okay finally in conclusion uh, site is pretty simple uh, but it is also the most popular postgres tool for doing horizontal scaling uh, so keep in mind that there is some value to simplicity. I also think that for a lot of people, you know, it's very abstract when I say like, oh, you know, just shard this table out, shard on this ID. Uh, hopefully this actually explains a little bit more. You know, you've got some sort of key column where you're like, I know that the rows with this value of this key column need to be co-located across these couple of tables. And Citus basically just lets you do that by choosing that as your particular distribution column. So hopefully this lets you think a little bit more concretely about how to model your data when you're using something like a relational database and trying to scale it out. Anyways guys, I hope you enjoyed the video, fairly short one, uh, but hopefully still informative. I'll see you in the next one and have a nice day.